All right then, let's get started. Thank you so much for coming to the last morning of this most amazing conference. I have to admit, I cried a little this morning that it was going to end. We waited for so long to be together, and now we are here, and it is lovely. So thank you again for your bright, shiny faces in the morning. It is my sincere pleasure to introduce Roz Livingstone. She is an occupational therapist in Vancouver, Canada, British Columbia. She is, um, it's midnight there, so it's, until a minute ago it was still Friday. She didn't even know how great Saturday was gonna be. So it's the middle of the night. And Roz and I have worked together for a very long time. She has run a beautiful conference in the Canada called the International Seating Symposium. We have published many papers together. And during COVID, we met every Thursday at 11 o'clock till one o'clock, right before pickleball. And that was the highlight for me of COVID, is every Thursday I knew that I would have my two hours with my friends, Rosa Livingstone and Lenore McLean, uh, working on a scoping review of standing for children with level GMSCS level four and five. So today we're gonna talk about early mobility and I give to you my very good friend and colleague, Roz Livingstone. Enjoy. Thank you, Ginny, for the introduction. And thank you to Lourdes and the committee for inviting me to make this presentation. I hope you're all having a wonderful time in Barcelona. And I'm sorry I can't be there with you in person. I've been asked to talk about augmenting mobility in early childhood. And I don't have any disclosures to make. The objectives for today, I'm going to describe profiles of children who can benefit from augmented mobility in early childhood, discuss the research evidence, and talk about some physical, social, and environmental factors influencing the introduction of uh, augmented mobility in early childhood. So the outline is, what do we mean by early augmented mobility? Why is independent mobility important? Who benefits? What's the research evidence? And how can we provide this experience in a way that's child and family led? So first of all, what's augmented mobility? Well, when most people think about wheelchairs, they think about manual wheelchairs. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about that. Power mobility, I mean power wheelchairs, power ride on toys and devices that have been developed for very young children and also supported stepping devices, also called supportive walkers. So why are we talking about early augmented mobility? Well, we know that cognitive development is grounded in early experience of sitting, interacting with objects and moving around and exploring. In fact, independent mobility is vital for overall development and young children typically begin to move around starting around nine, eight or nine months to 12 months of age. Now, children who have limited mobility, they can be developmentally disadvantaged and providing an, a way of augmenting their mobility by other means can allow them to enjoy movement and to learn from these experiences. In this study, they looked at typically developing toddlers and also two toddlers with cerebral palsy, one at GMFCS1 and one at GMFCS4. And what they found is that the typically developing children spent three to four hours a day moving around, exploring, interacting with peers and playing with toys. Whereas the children with cerebral palsy, they spent more time sitting and much less time interacting with peers and interacting with objects. So this shows us that there is a connection between moving around and exploring and development. In fact, there's a vicious circle. If you don't have mobility, then that reduces your opportunities for play and expression. You have lack of stimuli and less experience of control and initiation. This leads to developmental delay because of the deprivation. And that leads to frustration, reduced motivation and less confidence. And then it goes around again, that then reduces your opportunities for play and expression. So we need to break the cycle. We need to provide opportunities for children with disabilities to move and explore and interact with objects and interact with others at the same age of, as their peers. So that's nine to 12 months of age. 
Now, when we look at manual wheelchairs, um, this study by Elizabeth Rodby Bousquet and colleagues used the CPUP data from Sweden, and they found that of children with cerebral palsy up to 11 years of age, of 10 that were provided with a manual wheelchair, only one of those children was actually wheeling themselves around, especially outdoors. They were primarily being pushed by an adult, while three out of four children who were provided with a power wheelchair were able to be independent. So that really shows us that while manual mobility or manual wheelchairs facilitate caregiving, they don't facilitate independence in young children and not in children with cerebral palsy. So what about walking? Uh, supported stepping devices, I'm going to be talking a bit about this morning. They're also called gait trainers or support walkers. And we just mean a walker with an additional pelvic or trunk support and some kind of seat. Ginny, Peleg and I did a review of the outcomes of gait trainer use in children with disabilities. And what we found is that they were introduced in the literature the reports are from two or three years of age. Now, that's not young enough. It should be starting at nine to 12 months. And although positive outcomes were reported, the strength of evidence is limited, and that's why it's saying measure. You need to measure the outcomes to be sure that the intervention you're using is meeting um, the goals for that particular child. So the research conducted so far does show a statistically improvement in significant improvement in mobility and bowel function, uh, increased ability to take steps, and a trend in increased walking speed and distance for children with significant disabilities, as well as a trend to increased bone mineral density. And then there's descriptive evidence supporting activity outcomes in the influence on children's affect, their motivation, and their ability to participate with others. Um, I have to acknowledge that this is Ginny's great video of children interacting. So putting a child in an upright stepping device, the main goal, although it's really important to get children active using their muscles, maintaining their, you know, their bone mineral density, uh, preventing loss of stem satellite cells. Um, the primary goal with children with significant disabilities, that's GMFCS 4s and 5s, is to promote socialization, exploration, and participation with others. And I just really want to encourage that therapists, occupational and physical therapists, work with children in communities, work with the families in the homes and the community settings to, because that's where they're going to have meaningful goals where they can work on with this device. Um, calling these devices gate trainers is a bit of a misnomer because the goal is not really for these children to walk independently without the device. It's for them to socialize, to explore, to maintain their physical fitness. And that's going to happen in the community setting. So we all need to work together to work on goals that will promote using them um, in ways that are meaningful for the children and their families. But um, I just really like to say that uh, the um, using a, a, a walker or a stepping device is, not, is good for participation. This child is using it um, in the grocery store with her family, but you can see that's her twin brother that just ran after her there. You can see how efficient he is compared to her. So although we're working on maintaining stepping, we're working on physical fitness, we're working on participation, we might need to think about power mobility if we're thinking about efficiency in moving around and keeping up with others. And it's been 39 years since Charlene Butler um, did her first studies and showed that you can have young children independent in power wheelchairs around 18 to, you know, 24 months you can start um, using it independently before that it's more more of a play and moving to explore. And what she showed is that these children had increased interest in other mobility options once they had experience of independent mobility in the power wheelchair. Because the 
the therapists and the doctors were afraid that um, the children wouldn't want to walk or use other means of mobility. And actually, she showed just the opposite and recommended that if children don't have efficient mobility options, we should be starting to think about power mobility around one year old. Now, um, in North America, Lisa Kenyon and colleagues did this survey of a thousand occupational and physiotherapists. And while 80% of the therapists agreed quite strongly with statements about how important power mobility was for the development of children, 50% of them didn't actually provide any early power mobility experience to children on their caseloads, and they didn't refer them to other people who could do this. So it really makes us question, what's, why is there such a gap? 39 years is a long time from when it's been shown to be important. Why are we not introducing power mobility early on? And when we look at um, this study Palisano did in 2010, looking at what methods of mobility children used. And this slide shows children at GMFCS3. And you can see that children, that it's at four years of age, less than 10% of these children are walking independently in their home. Far more of them are being having assisted mobility that's being helped by an adult. And it's not until they're 14 that 50% of them are using walking as their primary means of mobility in their home. Whereas when you look at the GMFCS4s, they're provided with wheelchairs typically much earlier. And at four years old, more than 20% are actually getting around independently in their house using a wheelchair. And at 11 years of age, 50% of them are independent. So providing augmented mobility early on is an opportunity to provide independence for children. So who needs power mobility? Uh, Ginny and I did this Delphi consensus study in uh, 2014, it was published, and we uh, further developed these groups of children, children who are never going to walk, need early introduction of power mobility. Children who have inefficient mobility, that means they might be able to use a supportive walker or wheel and manual wheelchair, but they can't keep up with other children their age. That are children who lose mobility because of an illness um, or a, uh, an accident. And that are children who need mobility assistance only in early childhood. So for example, children at GMFCS2 are not able to walk on uneven surfaces until they're much closer to school age. So maybe they need a ride on toy to get around outside um, on the playground or in the park um, to have that easy experience of keeping up with other children and participating. And then when they're older, they're, they're gonna walk or they're gonna use the, the means of mobility. Children with spina bifida are usually good manual wheelchair users when they're older but they might not be efficient at very young ages. So for those children, you could use power mobility as an intervention early on. So what are the benefits of power mobility for children? Uh, this is based on Peter Rosenbaum and Jan Willem Gorter's F words, which use the ICF framework. And you can see there's a variety of outcomes and a range of um, ev evidence levels, um, but, uh, cognitive and receptive language skills are supported by quite strong evidence. Um, social and play skills, interaction with others tends to be more qualitative and case study evidence. Environmental factors are really important to think about because the attitudes of others and whether they expect children to be independent or whether they even provide them the opportunity to try really depends on societal attitudes, the attitudes of therapists and doctors if they're prescribing power mobility early on or if they're giving children opportunities to try these things. And what a lot of studies have shown is that once children have experience with power mobility, although parents might be reluctant initially when they see their children having success, then that changes their attitude completely. And it also has an impact on the attitude of others around them, that people see children as being more capable when they see them in a power wheelchair. 
um, and that affects society's attitudes. But we also have to realize that the size and the weight of devices is important and whether the environment's accessible. So there's a lot of factors to think about when you're introducing power mobility. This study um, is the highest level of evidence conducted to date. It's a small randomized control trial with 14 subjects and 14 controls. And the children using power mobility showed increased receptive language, increased development. They were more mobile. They needed less caregiver assistance. And there was no difference in motor skills between subjects and controls over a one-year period. These were all children GMFCS 4 or 5 equivalents and they were 14 to 30 months. This is the most recent evidence synthesis, and it was commissioned by the National Health Service in the United Kingdom. And what they found is there's a strong impact of power mobility on children's movement and mobility, and a moderate impact on, or moderate evidence supporting impact on participation, play, and social interaction. And they drew an important distinction between movement for movement's sake, which is how all young children move. They move around to explore and to learn. It's not destination-focused mobility when you're talking about a one-year-old or a two-year-old. It's not like an adult learning to drive a car. It's not like an older child learning to ride a bike and having to know safety rules. We don't expect young children to know safety rules. It's our job to keep them safe while they explore and they learn through moving. Independent mobility should not be a last resort. It's a human right. And if other if typically developing children are moving and exploring around 12 months of age, then we need to be thinking about providing these same opportunities for children with disabilities. And it's not either or. Jean Minkle is a physiotherapist and a master clinician in assistive technology provision in the US. And her, this is her phrase, the tyranny of or but the power of and. And for this little girl, you can see we used all the mobility methods. When you're thinking about a power wheelchair or power mobility, you're not dismissing that they're going to use a supportive mobility device. You're not dismissing that they're going to need a manual wheelchair for their parent to take them to appointments in the community or to places that their power wheelchair just can't go because the environment's not accessible. But providing all these methods, we maximize development and we maximize opportunities for learning and participation. So how do we go from power mobility, particularly being a last resort, to thinking of it as a first choice? Maybe that's the easiest way to put them in, in a toy or a small powered device that lets them move efficiently, get around, play with other children. And then when they get older, maybe they're going to use other mobility methods or they're going to walk. If they're going to walk, they're going to walk. Putting them in a power mobility device is not going to prevent that. So Heather Feldner wrote this great paper um, and she really reinforced that uh, if we're going to have power mobility be considered early on to provide efficient mobility, then we need developmentally appropriate power mobility devices. They need to be lightweight, they need to look like toys, they need to be affordable and they need to be fundable wherever you're living. Uh, University of Delaware and the Go Baby Go program, they've in, encouraged very early use of power mobility. That little girl um, in, the, in the bottom center uh, was 11 months old when they introduced power mobility as a treatment to encourage her to use her more affected right hand and to move independently. The little boy in the bottom left was only seven months old with spina bifida when they gave him opportunities to start moving and exploring. The little girl on the lower right, 14 months with Down syndrome, giving her opportunities to move around and to play with others rather than being dependent in a stroller and, and looking up at the sky and not being able to interact with other children. And in uh, British Columbia, where, um, where I am, we have used power mobility days. These are exploratory play-based sessions where children and families are invited to come and try out different devices. It's introduced as play. We don't talk about your child's not going to walk. Um, we need to get them a wheelchair. We say, 
there are lots of different ways to move and explore. Moving and exploring is very important for learning and we need to give them ways to do that. And they can try out different devices. And once parents see their child having fun and moving and experiencing independence, then they're the ones pushing to take it further. And some of the children will just use the toys for a short time. They'll use them in summer. The children that are having um, success, then the parents are pushing to go forward with other devices. And some of the therapists have also used these with, you know, there's a, a little caster carts or manual mobility devices and supportive walkers as well, giving the children all sorts of opportunities to play and explore. And I would just really encourage you um, to remember that power mobility is fun. It's not a last resort, it's not an either or, it's and. So if you're in a position to prescribe or to request power mobility, don't wait for children to get older. Give, start early because that's how you're going to provide, to promote child development and participation. And now, uh, if you have any questions, uh, I'm going to be uh, live online after, after this recording to take those. Thank you. We've had such a lovely conference here, Roz. We've missed you greatly. Um, Peter Rosenbaum gave a lovely keynote where he gave a story of a child who was given a power chair to go to the park and, uh, on a, and make friends. And Peter said, it's a gateway, not a destination. And for many of the children, what Roz is sharing with us is that a gate trainer, a stepping device, power mobility, it might not be what the child uses ultimately in their teenage years, but it's a gateway, not a destination. Iona Novak showed us a beautiful story about a boy who was using supported stepping to round the cows, but he wanted to muster the sheep, so we got power mobility. So let's muster our teams for power mobility and early mobility and supported steppings. So my first question to you, Roz, is what are your ideas to help us do this in low resource areas where we don't have access to all these amazing things that you do? Well. I mean, I think there's, um, for, for many years, uh, we didn't have great equipment either. It's been in more recent years that uh, the um, switch adapted ride on toys have become more prevalent and that's, those are fairly inexpensive to do. And we know that's happening in Brazil and, um, and other countries where there's, there's uh, less resources. Um, but for many years, we just used old equipment, recycled equipment. I think having uh, sharing resources, if you're doing things in a group session or in a play session, then that can give lots of children the opportunity to try. And then um, when people see things being successful, then they're often prepared to look into ways to make this happen more, more often. Um, but yeah, I've got... Um, pediatric power wheelchairs that are well over 20 years old that I'm still recycling and, um, and are being used um, by, by many children as an introductory device until you can get to the point where you can get more funding. It's such an inspiration, all you have accomplished as a clinician and then later in your career as a researcher to help us do the best thing. Are there any questions from the audience this morning? Anybody have a story they can share about how they're doing this in their community? Do we have any Go Baby Go or Go Zika Go people? <laughs> Elena. Hi. Um, well, I'm Elena. I'm from Spain, but working in Scotland right now. And well, I love all this about um, early mobility. Um, my question is a bit about what to do when families say they don't have space at home. Um, you know, to have this equipment, uh, even though you know that um, it's going to obviously enhance participation in community. Yeah, that can be a real challenge. Um, and I have 
with young children, especially the ones with more significant movement um, disorders where uh, they really need a large open space, that, that can be quite a challenge. I mean, I've had families who have used it in the like the parking garage of their, their building. Um, I've had families who've um, used space in a local school gym um, or a local uh, community hall in order to have a big space to practice in. Um, for many families of the, of the really young children um, who need more, more support, who are at the very beginning stages of learning, sometimes it's more successful to do it in, in a more therapy session um, where you have extra adults for support. And so those play-based sessions can be really helpful for that. Um, but yeah, doing it as, as, as part of a, a group session um, and therapists being able to facilitate that. Um, I think when families get to the point where they, they see their child really having success, then, then there's more motivation to be able to incorporate that into their life. But that can be, it can be more of a challenge, definitely. I think the mic is coming up front. Everyone on, we have lots of people online, Roz. Some friends from the Ukraine as well that are congratulating you on a lovely session. Oh, we have to turn it on. It should be on now. Is that better? Yes, that's better. Um, I love the tyranny of awe and the power of and, and I think that's, in, in our system, it's one of the things that we really struggle with. You, you might find a child that could um, do some self-propelling in a small environment, but really needs power mobility in a bigger environment. And the services are such that you can have one, but you can't have both. And, and it's, I thought that was a really powerful statement. And I just wondered if there's any extra thoughts Roz has on how we can deal with this tyranny of awe and the power of and. Because, you know, we don't have one option, do you? You might want to have a, a standing, walking a few steps and a self-propelled chair and a power mobility. And that's more, that would be fantastic for the children. And uh, yeah, how, how can we work more towards this? Right, so I have a regular bike, I have a road bike, I have a mountain bike, I have a kayak, I have lots of ways to move. And so where I live, we run a recycling group. We have this, we collect all the old equipment and then we give it out um, and so that you don't have to buy all these things. Then you bring it back when you're done. What say you, Roz? Yes, absolutely. I'm a great believer in recycling and uh, loan cupboards and all that shared equipment because with, with these young children, um, as, as you were saying earlier, Ginny, it's not, it's not always um, where you're going to end up. It's, you, the, the child isn't necessarily going to be a full-time power wheelchair user. Maybe they only need it for a short time. And when young children are learning, some of this equipment doesn't get, um, it doesn't get used until, until it's finished. The child might only need it for six months or a year or two years, and then it can be recycled for another child. If we can find ways to make that efficient, then, then hopefully children can have all the means of mobility. It's like all of us, we have lots of different ways to move, depending on how far you need to go, whether you're looking for exercise, whether you're just looking for efficiency to get there. Um, and we need to provide children with the same opportunities because yes, they need the manual wheelchair, they need the efficient power mobility for the learning perhaps, or for their, as their long-term mobility device. And they also need the stepping and, and all that experience together um, and finding a way to work with the funding agencies, which are different where, wherever we all are, we, we have different barriers we're up against, but having some way to show that it's providing all these means of mobility for, it's like the right piece of equipment for the, at the right time for the right activity so that the child has the maximum participation and developmental benefits. What you did with the F word charts, we've done that in a couple of papers we've published on supported stepping as well, where you have all the areas of the F words. We need to get up. We need to reduce sedentary behavior for a lifespan approach, as Mark Peterson has told us. Martin Gao has told us we can hold on to the stem cells, get less fat in the muscle, do better if we get the children moving early at 9 to 12 months when muscle atrophy begins and get them going. 
So what a challenging, lovely session to end our um, plenary sessions. I think, Roz, you pulled together so well all of the plenaries we had today. We thank you so much for coming in in the middle of the night from Vancouver, and we look forward to your further research. Thank you so much, everyone, for being here. Thank you.